Hey guys, um, this is a takedown of the China study by Denise Minger. It's a takedown that she did on the fifth annual low carb cruise back in May of 2012. So some time ago, a lot of people have probably haven't seen this takedown and uh, a lot of people have had probably vagoons, um, you know, pushing the China study in their face um, and pretty much being quite obnoxious about it without many of them even having read the actual true study itself. Now, the book called The China Study is not The China Study, okay? It's a publisher's sort of title. It's a book that uh, um, T. Colin Campbell wrote many years after and his publisher is the one that actually recommended that he call the book The China Study, even though it doesn't only cover his work in China, but it also covers a whole lot of other things. So it's a bit yeah, misleading sort of title, you could say. The actual study um, or the actual research, to be more precise, um, that was undertaken was called the dietary lifestyle on mortality in china and it was basically a, a rural um, a 1983 to 84 survey of 65 counties in rural china so that's what it was actually um the actual study itself um and it was actually a whole lot of statistical um data points so it was an epidemiological study um, and epidemiolo epidemiology um, can only, cannot prove causa causality. It is only, can show associations um, and only that. But even those associations were very different than the ones that actual um, T. Colin Campbell later on claimed that the research actually showed. Now, the nice thing about Denise is she had a bit of time off from an accident and she spent a number of months, you know, going, um, first she acquired the book, then she spent a number of months going through all the data points and pulling apart um, the information. And what she did was, what she, to her own surprise, she came up with, you know, that what T. Colin Campbell claims in his book that he published later on, his what I call the Vagoonerized propaganda piece that he that he produced later on, is 180 degrees out of sync with the actual data. Also, she brings to um, people's attention certain studies that were actually generated that T. Colin Campbell was involved. Now, when you do epidemiological survey, you collect a whole lot of data points and stuff like that, and you, and you actually have, then what people do is they use those, that data information then to produce studies. So they, they will generate a whole lot of studies. His early studies actually were, um, had, let's say, pushed the idea that, uh, you know, it was more plant protein, which was a problem rather than animal protein. But then at a later stage, this was many years later um, from the, these early 80s sort of survey that they had actually done, he had actually you know, been influenced by looking at some rat studies that were done in the Philippines. And then basically from that, extrapolating a whole lot of different thinking. This is the danger of reductionism, guys. It's what's happened to Salad Boy and many others in our community, in the low carb community, you know, falling into repeatism type thinking. They look at this reductionist, um, it's usually animal based research. And from there, they extrapolate a whole lot of different dietary or meanings from it. You can't do that. But that basically ends you, ends you, takes you down the road of crack pottery and nothing else. Now, this, um, that's one point that I want to make. The second point I want to make is the N15 data. If anyone has any 
let's say, doubts in their mind, always go back to the N15 data. The N15 data is quite emphatical. It's archaeological data. It looks at the long bones of humans over thousands and thousands of years. And what do we find? Very high levels of um, the Delta 15 nitrogen isotopes in those long bones, which tells us quite clearly that the source of the protein in our ancestors was that coming from animal sources, primarily. They were super and hyper carnivores, as they've been described by archaeologists. Now, what were the sources of the animals? Well, then we have to look at the types. So if you're basically got like the modern agricultural sources are most of the plants are C, C3 carbon or C3 plants as they're called. And then there are C4 plants, which is the, primarily the grasses. So you look at what, the, so now there is an isotope called Delta 13 carbon, which basically indicates that if the source is primarily from grasses, C4 plants. And what do we find in the long bones? The, the expression of this type of isotope which tells us quite clearly that the animal source of our ancestors was primarily animal and ruminant in nature. It's a slam dunk. Bone, collagen from the long bones do not lie. They're quite emphatically about that. Only academics who've got basically certain vested interests in some narrative for whatever reason or because they've succumbed to reductionism and misunderstood a lot of things. Now, the survey data that basically um, this young lady, Denise, drilled through is data that was actually collected between 1983 and 1984 um, in 65 counties in rural China. What they looked at is sort of dietary lifestyle and disease characteristics were studied. So sometimes, you know, there are certain toxins in the environment that can get into the food supply. So she covers all that sort of stuff, stuff as well to explain some of the confounding variables um, in the sort of uh, outcomes that, or that were detected within the data. They were basically done within 65 counties. Two villages were selected and 50 families in each were randomly chosen. This is not a randomized control study. It's just basically they just randomly selected certain people in the village. It's still fundamentally an epidemiological observational study. Um, one adult from each household, half men, half women, 6,500 were included in the entire survey. They sort of took some blood, some urine and food samples for later. Now, the problem with food sampling is can be quite biased. Researchers have got their own sort of biased research can actually be selective, what they select and what they don't. So that's the other thing. And remember, in households, grains and other things are usually um, kept. Animals basically get slaughtered at a later date when they become part of that food supply. So you're going to have a disproportion of certain types of foods. You need to do N15 data, N14, N15 data to determine that sort of stuff. Um, but there were also questionnaires. So three-day dietary information was recorded and people... So there's a lot of confounding sort of stuff. The amount of, you know, these are not long-term um, re records of what people eat over a long period of time. These are short terms. They are short-term measurements. And we know with blood works and urine works and food samples, there's a lot of confounding variables that can vary these things um, over time, you know, within any part. So, so the, the key thing is you need, to, you need to always keep that in mind. So here's Denise's takedown of the diet, lifestyle, mortality in China a study of the characteristics of 65 Chinese counties. And I hope you enjoy this because a lot of people haven't seen this because it's quite old information and 
at least you'll be able to get a bit of a more deeper understanding of, you know, the actual real data um, from the China study and not the sort of fabricated sort of propaganda that um, T. Colin Campbell sort of put in his book at a later stage. And you'll also get some insights on how these things are done, how these studies are done, how they're generated, and some of the problems with them. And also, you'll also get a deep amount of information when it came to the actual source. What is the source? Which is the blue book, which all the data points. So when in the future you get vagoons or other family members sort of rattling, have you read the Twitter study? Sort of at you, always ask them, have you read the blue book? Have you gone through three months of the data points within the blue book to validate whether what T. Colin Campbell claims in his the China study book actually represents what he really collected, him and his group? That's how you should challenge these people and always direct them to this video in order for them to see Denise's Minga's takedown of the China study. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you. You're so good to me, Jimmy, except when we play words with friends. Um, so last night I realized uh, at dinner that John Briffa is going to be following me and that made me really insecure because he's British and I'm an American and I pronounce my R's. So I was wondering, I was trying to figure out how I could possibly one-up him and so I was going to just scrap this whole presentation and do an interpretive like statistical dance but I, I, when I dance it looks like I have epilepsy so I decided since I'm not on a ketogenic diet you guys might get confused and send me to like the cruise hospital. So I'm sticking with my presentation and uh, to compete with the Brit, I'm just going to let you know, it was my birthday four days ago. And it was not, <laughs> thank you! And as far as I know, it was not John's birthday four days ago. So <laughs> just keep that in mind when you're listening to him talk. All right, now we can get started. How many people have read this book, The China Study? <laughs> Who could read it? <laughs> How many people have attempted to read it? <laughs> Hands up, okay. How many people have not read it, but you've looked online for reasons that it's wrong because you don't want it to be true? Okay, well, there we go. So that's probably how maybe you found my blog or there's some other critiques out there that are wonderful, like uh, by Chris Masterjohn and Anthony Colpo. And uh, uh, has anyone here just never actually even heard of this book before and this is kind of new to you? couple people. Uh, so obviously you do not have any vegan friends on Facebook. Otherwise you would know by now that this book is the bane of your existence. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, the China Study, it was written by T. Colin Campbell, who's the professor emeritus at Cornell University. And this is not just any professor emeritus off the street. He is very credentialed. He has over 300 scientific publications and uh, he has worked for 40 years as a researcher. So he holds a lot of weight in the scientific community just because of all of his experience. And the book itself is 417 pages and for some reason a lot of people think the book is actually peer-reviewed but it's not. It's published by Ben Bella Books which uh, puts out other titles like uh, The Psychology of the Simpsons and You're Not Supposed to Talk About Fight Club and a lot of pop culture stuff. So it's kind of interesting that his book got lumped in with this particular publisher. And um, the, the, the book, the, it's named after the China study, which I'll talk about in a minute, but this particular book was uh, called The Grand Priests of Epidemiology by the New York Times. And if you read that, the first time like me and you're like what's the grand pricks that sounds painful that actually means it's the grand prize it's a word in French and it just means it's like this really amazing thing that we should all be in awe of and uh, while I was actually doing research for this I came across an interesting summary of the China study where someone said the book is more talked about than actually read which I thought was so true because even people who use this thing to prove their point often haven't even read the book itself so uh, let's move on this is some of what the China study tells us is true. First thing, which I think will probably not jive with a lot of people in this crowd, is that uh, animal protein promotes can cancer growth like a carcinogen. And in fact, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate if it would be true. Uh, and we're going to talk about that, why it's not true. But um, 
Campbell himself has actually said that certain proteins like casein and milk should actually be qualified and uh, classified as carcinogens. So it's a little extreme, but a lot of people have read this book and come away completely believing it's true. Um, the book also blames animal products in any form, doesn't matter if it's grass-fed, free-range, whatever. All of it, no matter what, is going to contribute to chronic disease. Things like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, you name it, animal products are the cause. So you can kind of see by now why uh, vegans really like this book and why you guys probably don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> And uh, Campbell also strongly opposes low-carb diets, and he has a lot of reasons for that. And for anyone who's ever been on Amazon.com and you know how they have reviews that you post and then you can comment on the reviews, if you go to any of the Atkins books, you will find a review from Campbell that has like 400 comments after it, which he's participating in arguing with people, which is, if you ever want to just kill a day or four or a week, <laughs> just, you can go online and you can watch this, and it's just, it's almost like a sitcom in some sense. So, uh, I don't know how he has time to do that, but it seems like one of his hobbies, so if, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, and, uh, so I mentioned this earlier, it's named after the China study, which is a 20-year epidemiological project that Campbell was the director of. So that's where the title of the book comes from, even though the entire book itself is not only about the China study. So what is the China study study? And I have to say that as an English major, writing study study just killed me. It's like Rio Grande River, but this is how I'm distinguishing uh, the China study from the actual study itself, the book versus the study. So it's also called the China Cornell Oxford Project, and it's, it's an observational study of 65 rural counties in China with a thousand people in each county that they uh, observed and took data from. And then they compiled and averaged all the, the values for each county so that we ended up with 65 data points. So it's actually, even though it's a huge study, we actually don't have that many data points for it, which is not a great thing in terms of statistical analysis, but uh, it is what we have to work for, and it's actually a very well done study in most respects. And so the mortality data for the study was taken from the 1970s, and the rest was from the early 1980s. And as I mentioned, this is an epidemiological study. Is it all right? We all right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, does anyone know what epidemiology is? Have some idea? A couple people? Yeah. So the, the technical uh, breakdown of it is um, the study of things that can never, ever, 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 ever prove cause and effect. If you look it up in the dictionary, it should say this, but it usually doesn't. Uh, that's a shame because this is kind of the truth. But if we actually break down the word, it's uh, epi, which means upon or on. like. Does anyone remember being in third grade and someone said, oh, your epidermis is showing, and you're like mortified because you had no idea what that was? Remember that? Epi is like on you. Your skin is on you. And then dem is people. So epidemiology is the study of what is upon the people. It's the study of disease in populations. But epidemiology is observational, which means we don't actually manipulate variables to see what is causing what. We just take a bunch of data and we see, okay, this is happening, this is happening, they're kind of happening at the same time, we don't really know why, but there you have it. So the unfortunate part of this type of uh, field of study is that it often it takes, uh, it catches fire in the media. Whenever we have an epidemiological study come out that shows, you know, meat is causing cancer in people or that it's associated with cancer or something, everyone assumes uh, correlation equals causation, which is just not true. The things that we see in epidemiology can never prove cause and effect. So we know right away that the China study itself uh, cannot prove cause and effect. So, what? Right away? Oh my goodness, right after I told you I was an English major too. Okay, well, let's just pretend that was a pun, okay? <laughs> um, anyway, so just ignore that word. And uh, since this isn't a controlled study, <laughs> great, great. Uh, since this isn't a controlled experiment, there's nothing in the China study that is actually proving anything. So just keep that in mind as we're talking today. 
So all this data was taken and it was published in a 900 page book called Diet, Lifestyle and Mortality in China. And this is a really hard book to find, I know because I looked for a long time to find it. And it's basically just page after page after page of numbers. Correlations between all the variables. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Scrolls of them. If you like numbers, it's beautiful. If you hate math, it is terrifying. So a lot of people ask me, um, for those of you who don't know yet, I did a lengthy critique of this particular book and the study. And for some reason, my, I guess, purpose of uh, doing this critique is often shrouded in mystery or suspicion because people ask me all the time if I'm funded by the meat industry or the dairy industry or if I even exist and I'm, I don't even know. <laughs> I really don't know that, how that would work, but um, I thought I would just tell you really quickly, also get my water. I thought I'd tell you really quickly just my, my own intention for this. And uh, I am a recovered vegan slash vegetarian. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, it was a long, grueling process. <laughs> um, and for those of you who've never heard any of my background, I was actually a vegetarian for 10 years. I started when I was um, seven years old. Seven, and I gave up meat at that point in my life, and my parents thought it was a phase. It, I guess it was a phase, but it lasted a long time. And by the time I was in my early teens, I had gone to veganism, and then by the time I was about 14, 15, I was a raw vegan. And does anyone know what raw veganism is? I was living on fruits and vegetables, and I was so entrenched in this dogma that I thought my diet was the healthiest thing they could possibly eating, be eating, because fruits and vegetables are so healthy, right? So why not just eat fruits and vegetables? So here I was, uh, you know, 16 years old. All of a sudden, my health was falling apart, and uh, the the breaking moment for me came actually when I was 17 and in the dentist office for my yearly cleanup. And I should mention that I'm the kind of person who, when I was little, at sleepovers, I would be the kid laying wide awake, like unable to sleep because I hadn't brushed my teeth, because I would feel so bad. Like all the other kids would be passed out in a sugar coma, and I would like sneak out into the hallway to floss in secrecy, because that's how dedicated I was to my dental health. So I hadn't had almost any problems for my entire life. I had taken great care of my teeth. Here I was, 17 years old, back in the dentist chair, waiting for my glowing report. And all of a sudden, the dentist started making comments and noises that you really don't want to hear from a dentist. Like, mmm, ooh, ah. Oh. <laughs> you know, so I was getting really worried. And by the end of the dentist visit, I found out I had 16 cavities. And that's, that's a ballpark figure, because they were, there were so many cavities, they were growing on top of each other. They were just, my, and at 17, you know, so it's at that point that I realized I really needed to make some changes. So I started investigating uh, just nutrition in general, and I ended up, uh, coming across Weston A. Price material. Ended up, heard some clapping, we have some Weston A. Price fans. Yeah, great stuff. I, I really owe them uh, a tremendous amount. Um, so at that point, I ended up transitioning back to an omnivorous diet and I restored my health. So that's, that's my quick story right there. And that's kind of why I was interested in vegan subjects and things like the China study to begin with, because I have a very long history in that community. And so when I came across this book, it really didn't fit with my experience as a vegan or my understanding of human history and physiology, which obviously includes a lot of animal product consumption. Because we have never been vegans. It just doesn't make sense to me that that would be our optimal diet. So I was a little suspicious of the book the first time I read it, but that's not when I actually critiqued it, because this was back in, I think, 2006. And uh, eventually I decided I wanted to see for myself whether the claims in the book were actually legitimate. I wanted to see if the things that were being said here and that people were throwing over my head as, you know, this is why veganism is the best, I wanted to see if that was true. And, because I'm curious like that. So, I also wanted to just win at the internet. Because people, <laughs> people, I, I, okay, I used to have this issue where I would like to invite unnecessary aggravation into my life, and I would do that by hanging out on vegan message boards and getting in uh, debates with people about why veganism wasn't optimal. So, um, there came a point where I just got so sick of people using this book as the last word. They were just like, whatever I'd say, they'd say, well, just read the China study, because that is, makes you wrong. And so this kind of sums up how I was feeling for a while. 
And there was a particular message board that I used to hang out on uh, that I will not name names, but it promotes a very large consumption of bananas. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. And I was getting into some big fights on that, on that site. I mean, our dis debates on that fight, on that site, uh, with a particular person. And he was very, uh, very set in his ways about this China study being true. So it was at that point where I decided to track down this book and go over the data myself. I had, due to life circumstances, which I won't go into at the moment, uh, I had some extra time, I had some insurance money from a car accident I was in. So I was like, well, I'm gonna take a few months and I'm just gonna be a nerd and I'm gonna look at all these numbers in this giant, giant book and I'm gonna see what they say because that sounded fun to me. Are we, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, and uh, so I got this book, again, I spent two to three months daily just pouring over the numbers Book, bookmarking it, dog-earing, typing out things out in my computer, running some statistical analysis on it. And what I found was uh, none of the claims in the book seemed to match the data. And it was, there was such a stark difference between what the raw data said and what the book said the data said that I was just stunned. And I was like, I have to do something about this. I have to put this online for people to read. At the time, I had this little blog called Raw Food SOS, which I still have. And I had originally started it to help raw vegans recover their health because I didn't think they were getting the right information from their community. So I posted this uh, on the internet, a long critique of everything I'd found about the book that I found to be wrong. And at the time, I expected maybe a couple people to read it, because my blog had a readership of maybe five people a day, and I think four of those were my mother on different computers. <laughs> so I, and, uh, so I was, I was going to be really excited if more than that read anything on my blog. So I posted it online, and indeed, uh, it got viral. It went viral on the internet almost overnight. Thanks to the help of a lot of different paleo bloggers and low-carb bloggers, it was dispersed over the internet and my blog went from about 5 to 10 views a day to 20,000 overnight in one night. And uh, eventually the author, Colin Campbell, caught wind of my critique and he apparently slapped me down on vegsource.com as you can see. And if you've ever been to vegsource you'll understand that it's a very uh, pro-vegan site. So uh, we got in a little online debate for a while and I ended up writing a couple more kind of reviews and critiques of his work and I think eventually he decided it was just more fun to hang out on Amazon.com review threads than talk to me. So he kind of disappeared and uh, so that's that's the brief uh, history of how I did this and how I came to be on the stage today. So, um, water. So one of the things I noticed as I was analyzing this data and comparing it to what Campbell was saying, was that Campbell repeatedly made the claim in his book that animal products were like just almost, perf well not perfectly, but the direction of the data was pointing that animal foods were correlated with diseases, uh, Western diseases like heart disease, cancer, diabetes. And um, from, if, from reading the book, the impression I took was that the data was generally all pointing in its direction and that it was something that was clear cut, like the animal products were clearly linked to disease. So what I discovered was that Campbell was actually doing something kind of sneaky. He was saying that, okay, in the data we have higher cholesterol is associated with Western diseases, which it can be confounded by a lot of things, but there was a slight trend towards this. It wasn't perfect at all. And then on top of this, he was saying, well, animal protein in the data is associated with higher cholesterol. And so in the book, he was saying, Therefore, animal protein must be correlated with Western diseases because we have this chain of variables. But when I looked in the data, the animal protein was not associated with any disease. The people who were eating more animal protein were not getting sicker. There was something else confounding the cholesterol connection there that uh, made it look to Campbell like there was an, a link there. But if people who are eating more animal protein weren't the ones getting more disease, how can you say that they are? So this was some, the first thing that really baffled me, and uh, it's one thing that I wrote a lot about on my critique. What I deduced from that was that cholesterol is not a direct marker from animal, for animal food consumption. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced maybe even your cholesterol going down or changing, becoming better as you're on a higher animal product diet. It's not something that's completely linear where you're vegan and your cholesterol is low and you're an omnivore and your cholesterol is high. It just doesn't work that way. So Campbell kind of assumed that it did, which I think was a big problem in the book. 
And uh, in the data, the non-fish animal protein, which is stuff from like meat, eggs, and dairy, it had no statistically significant association with any disease, none at all. And it was negatively correlated with most cancers, which means that people eating more of this kind of protein were actually getting less cancer than everybody else. And we didn't hear about that in the China study book. And fish protein was the only thing that had anything kind of funky about it, and it was strongly associated with liver cancer. But the fish-eating regions uh, were near water, which is like kind of humid regions, and this is where hepatitis B and aflatoxin, which is a carcinogen that causes liver cancer, that's where it proliferates. So it's kind of a question of, okay, are you going to blame the fish for this, or are you, sorry, you going to fix me? Okay. Am I a cat? No, it's <laughs> Not staying. That's staying. Okay. <laughs> We're having technical difficulties. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, is the China study based on that book? The China study, the book itself, it's, it has one chapter based on this China study, and uh, the rest of it is a compilation of some other things I'll be talking about a little bit later in the presentation. But it, it's called the China study. I think that was the the publisher's decision, and I don't think actually Campbell was going to call it that originally. So it's kind of misleading because the entire book is not just about the China study. But the part, the part that's from uh, uh, Chinese statistics comes from that book. Yeah, that blue book, that's all the China study itself. Yeah, the, the China study study. <laughs> yeah, you're very welcome. Okay, are we good? We need duct tape. That's okay. <laughs> Okay. Oh, it's oh, sorry guys, I didn't realize it was flickering like that. Could be. Okay, well, I'll keep talking, I guess. Um, so fish protein was uh, only associated with that one kind of cancer, and apart from that, for the, for the most part, fish was associated negatively with most diseases. So people who were eating more fish were living longer, getting less disease, overall they were healthier. Yet, nonetheless, fish is one of the foods that we're supposed to eliminate based on the China study. Go figure. We good now? Thank you very much for your taping. Thank you for fixing me. Now, here's the really interesting part. Plant protein has more positive associations with cancer than animal protein does, including with colon cancer and leukemia. So this is from the raw data. This is something that's in the book, that blue book of statistics and correlations. And it's not something that we heard about in the China study book. And this is uh, also interesting. You would think that uh, out of everything, based on what we hear just by conventional wisdom, that meat products uh, and animal protein would maybe be associated with heart disease, because that's what we're told all the time. These foods cause heart disease. In the China study data, the correlation between fish or for animal protein that didn't come from fish and heart disease was 0 0.01, which is almost, for anyone who has a statistical background, this is almost perfectly neutral. There's no relationship whatsoever. And the correlation between fish protein and heart disease was actually slightly inverse, which means that people eating more fish were getting less heart disease. And the people who are eating more plant protein were actually getting more heart disease. Go figure. Now, this is uh, kind of my favorite part. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. Um, yeah. So, one of the most interesting things that came out of this, from my perspective, and it was actually not something I even harped on too much in my first critique of the book, was that um, out of every single food, remember there are 367 variables that were measured, out of every single food that was documented in the China study, wheat had the strongest correlation with heart disease and stroke. It was astronomically high. It was higher than any other food and any other disease, which baffled me. So this was also interesting. We also had the strongest association with BMI, body mass index, out of any food. And this is something that a persisted even after I tried adjusting for calorie intake, activity level, macronutrient ratios, and other foods. I, I have no explanation for this, and I'll say once more that correlation isn't causation, so this isn't proof that wheat is going to kill you or make you fat and give you heart disease. But it is super interesting, because this correlation was so much stronger than anything that had anything to do with animal products, yet this was completely left out of the China study book. And uh, 
I found this really interesting. After, in one of those critiques that uh, Campbell wrote of my critique, which I flashed earlier on the VegSource website, he wrote uh, in response to what I wrote about pointing out this strong correlation about wheat, he said, the correlation of wheat flour and heart disease is interesting, but I'm not aware of any prior and biologically plausible and convincing evidence to support an hypothesis that wheat causes these diseases. So basically he's saying, oh, that's interesting, but I've never heard of that before. We don't have any evidence. So imagine my surprise when I found this paper by Campbell himself, written in 1996. <laughs> Significant differences in the diet of rural Chinese population studied suggest that wheat consumption may promote higher insulin, higher triglycerides, and lower sex hormone binding globulin, which is a marker of insulin resistance. Such a profile is consistent with that commonly associated with obesity, dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. <laughs> So, I don't know, this, this was uh, 2010, this was 1996. I don't know what happened in those 14 years to make this paper completely disappear from memory, but there it is in a peer-reviewed journal, nonetheless. Brain fog. Uh, brain fog, that must be it. Maybe I had a lot of, it was, maybe it was too much wheat causing brain fog. It could have been a lot of things. And uh, this was a little bit more about it. So he said there were no biologically plausible mechanisms that he knew of. He actually wrote about some biologically plausible mechanisms in this very paper. And he wrote, uh, I'll just quit, I don't want to just read quotes all day, but this is, uh, I found it was interesting. The effect of rice and wheat on sex hormone binding globulin was remarkable and unexpected. Nevertheless, there is some evidence to suggest that rice and wheat can have significantly different effects on the biochemical variables we measured. Wheat may be unique in its relative capacity to stimulate insulin. The relative differences in the fatty acid proportions and amylose content for wheat and rice may be thus responsible for modulating serum sex hormone uh, binding globulin, I mix those letters up, triglycerides and insulin. So he was already writing about possible mechanisms that involved wheat. I just found it astounding that this was actually one of his peer-reviewed papers, and it just received absolutely no mention in the China study book. I mean, there wasn't a single bad thing said about wheat. And again, this isn't proving causation, but the fact that he relied so heavily on the China study data to prove his animal protein causes heart disease and cancer stuff, and used so many kind of sneaky chains of variables to prove that, and yet ignored this direct, astounding correlation, that really disturbed me. Now let's look at a few other papers that uh, were spawned by the China study data. And I wanted to put this up because a lot of the criticism I receive is that I'm an English major and therefore I don't know how to read scientific papers and I'm probably just making stuff up. And again, maybe I don't even exist, so how could I write a critique? <laughs> so, so uh, a few, actually about a year after I wrote my first critique, I put out a second post that I don't think as many people read, but uh, I compiled everything I could find about the China study data that had been written by actual researchers. And I was thinking, well, okay, is this stuff that actually supports what Campbell wrote about in his book? So this is some of the stuff I found. Uh, this was pretty awesome. Within China, neither plasma total cholesterol nor LDL cholesterol was associated with cardiovascular disease. So here we have, this is a paper by, paper by Campbell himself, where he's saying that cholesterol was not associated with heart disease in the China study data, which is a blatant contradiction of what we read in the book. The results indicate that geographical differences in cardiovascular disease mortality within China are caused primarily by factors other than dietary or plasma cholesterol. Maybe wheat has something to do with that. I don't know. I don't want to make assumptions, but I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, in a, this is another example of how his research has been misinterpreted, usually by himself, I think. Um, and I also want to say, I don't want to pick on Campbell too much, because I, I really don't like to make science personal. And I'm, I'm kind of poking fun of it right now. But in all honesty, if you ever wanted to eat a salad with me, I would totally be happy to talk with him. <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to get that out there. Uh, this is what he wrote, or what was written uh, in an interview by him. Um, he wrote that animal protein, including that from dairy products, may leach more calcium from the bones than is, is ingested. How many people have heard this claim before? It's, it's pretty common among vegans. And, uh, and he said, uh, so this was talking about a specific paper that was based on the China study data using just a couple counties. So Campbell and other researchers analyzed the role of dietary calcium in bone density by following closely the diets of 800 women from five counties that have very different diets in China. 
Analyses of the data suggest that increased levels of animal-based proteins, including protein from dairy products, almost certainly contribute to a significant loss of bone calcium, while vegetable-based diets clearly protect against bone loss, Campbell reported. Just remember that as we look at this next thing. So I looked up the actual study that he was talking about, that he published. The results strongly indicated that dietary calcium, especially from dairy sources, increased bone mass in middle-aged and elderly women by facilitating optimal peak bone mass earlier in life. Calcium from dairy sources was correlated with bone variables to a higher degree than was calcium from non-dairy sources. So this is almost perfectly opposite of what he reported in the Cornell uh, Chronicle article. And I think it just it's an ongoing unfortunate thing because so much of the data in the China study is fascinating and I think that it could be a great place to, to start to look for more or look for ideas for further experiments that might be able to clarify what's going on with it. But the fact that most people only see the China study book version of the China study means that much of this data, much of the findings are never going to see the light of day. So unless you're actually surfing PubMed and being a nerd and that sort of thing, uh, it's likely that you will never hear about this anywhere. Unfortunate. Here's another good one by Campbell himself. It is the largely vegetarian inland communities who have the greatest all-risk mortalities and morbidities and who have the lowest LDL cholesterols. It could well be that there is a minimum level of LDL cholesterol below which cell membranes are adversely affected. Now this contradicts something that's a very popular idea within the plant-based or vegan communities, which is that if your cholesterol is below 150, total cholesterol below 150, you're said to be heart attack proof, which first of all isn't true, but it's also uh, something that is parroted so often that a lot of people believe it is. And I think that the fact that Colin Campbell po uh, pointed out this in one of his own articles is really important because yes, your cholesterol can be too low and yes, that can cause problems. And it appears that in the China study data, it was the people with the lowest cholesterol that were actually the unhealthiest. So, and this, who knows who Walter Willett or Frank who are, yeah, pretty famous researchers. They wrote in, uh, this is also a peer-reviewed uh, letter to, I forget which journal, but it was called Reply to T.C. Campbell. And they both wrote, a survey of 65 counties in rural China, which is the China study, did not find a clear association between animal product consumption and risk of heart disease or major cancers. So there we have Walter Willett and Frank Hu. If you don't want to listen to me, listen to these guys. These guys are saying the same thing. The China study data did not show an association between these things. Okay, now the other part of the China study that tends to get a lot of attention is Campbell's rat research. And this is something that started, uh, it was inspired when he was working in the Philippines in the 70s. And he caught wind of a study that some Indian researchers were doing where they were feeding rats different levels of the protein casein, which is one of the major uh, milk proteins. And what they were doing in this experiment was they were exposing... Uh, exposing two groups of rats to high levels of aflatoxin, which is a carcinogen that when your liver uh, detoxifies it, it can become a carcinogenic metabolite and it can basically cause liver cancer. So what, this, what these researchers were finding was that when they exposed these rats to high levels of aflatoxin and then fed, fed one group 5% casein and another group 20% casein, the 5% group was actually staying free from cancer, whereas the 20% casein group was getting cancer. So Campbell started wondering at this point, does animal protein cause cancer? And notice that he leapt from casein, a very specific, isolated, refined protein, to all animal protein in general. So that's kind of a big leap. Uh, so according to the China study, uh, uh, anyway, I actually missed a step. Uh, Campbell ended up replicating a lot of this research because he was so fascinated by it. So he... Uh, for many years, he was working with rats, doing the same kind of aflatoxin and casein uh, study experiments, and he was finding pretty much the same thing, that when the, the rats were fed a very low level of casein, they were staying free from cancer, and the ones that were getting more protein were getting cancer. So we're led to believe that uh, uh, just animal protein in general could turn cancer on and off. Oh, that shouldn't say Campbell. That should say cancer. Could turn cancer on and <laughs> Freudian slip. Oh, okay. Could turn cancer on and off like a switch. That, that's just a casein. Okay. Uh, just by varying the amount of casein, he fed them. So 
this is a, a very kind of disturbing thing to think about. It's like, wow, is the amount of animal protein I eat affecting my risk of getting cancer? And so the takeaway from the book is that yes, it is, and you should be not eating as you should be limiting your animal protein intake to very small amounts if you eat it at all. So Campbell declares that the milk protein casein is a potent carcinogen. So here we are talking about an actual food substance casein, something that is in breast milk that we all consumed as a child, and it's apparently a carcinogen. Scary stuff. So according to Campbell, uh, in other studies that he conducted using uh, plant protein in place of casein, he discovered that when he used gluten and soy protein instead of casein, uh, actually, in neither case, even at 20% levels, uh, none of the rats were getting cancer. So from that, he concluded that all animal protein must be uh, contributing to cancer growth and all plant protein must be protecting against it. And what he didn't tell us in the book is that when he uh, restored the missing amino acids in the plant protein, they behaved exactly like casein and they, the rats started getting cancer again, which means that it's not something specific about animal protein that was promoting cancer growth. It was just having complete amino acids um, because that is what actually promotes cell growth in general, including that of tumors. So this was a, a nice little thing to leave out from the book because anyone who is even a vegan is going to be getting complete protein if they're eating multiple kinds of foods each day. You can't get around it. So his, his experiments don't necessarily have much relevance to real life, especially if you're not a rat eating a refined diet from birth until death. So now this was really interesting. And it's actually something that I didn't put in my original critique. So if you didn't read my Forks Over Knives critique, actually, did anyone in here read my Forks Over Knives critique? Oh, wow, cool. Ooh. This is something I found later, and I really wish that I had found it earlier, and I could have put it in my first one because it was fascinating. But so in India, along with these researchers doing experiments on rats, there are researchers doing the same kind of experiment, almost identical with monkeys. And so this was in the 1980s, and they were doing the same study. They were uh, feeding, or they were exposing the monkeys to aflatoxin, feeding them different levels of protein, and seeing what happened. Except the one difference um, was that with the rat studies, they were using a huge amount of aflatoxin. Like they were just exposing the rats to almost impossible amounts that, that would never happen in real life. But, oopsie. <laughs> but uh, the one, there's one study that was done on monkeys that uh, instead of feeding this huge dose of aflatoxin, or exposing them to a huge dose of aflatoxin, they're exposing them to daily smaller doses of aflatoxin, which is what would happen if you were living in an area that had aflatoxin contaminated food and you're eating a little bit with each meal. So this actually resembles something that could happen in real life. So as with Campbell's rats, one group of monkeys got 5% of their diet is casein, and the other got 20%. Can you guess what happened in this case? The low-protein monkeys died. What happened to the high-protein monkeys eating all that animal protein? <laughs> they were fine. They were fine. So these results are almost completely opposite of what Campbell found using his less realistic animal experiments. And what it shows is that it's actually the level of aflatoxin that kind of influences what happens once you're feeding different diets or different levels of casein. And uh, the real quick version of what's going on is that when you're eating a protein deficient diet, your liver, uh, enzyme activity in your liver decreases and basically you can't detoxify the things you're eating. So if you're eating, if you're exposed to aflatoxin and you're eating a protein deficient diet, instead of your body detoxifying the aflatoxin and turning it into um, carcinogenic metabolites, what happens is it just stays in your body as an acutely a toxic thing and it creates liver damage. And so in some cases, uh, like with our, these poor guys, they were having such severe liver damage from their low protein diet that they just died. They died before they could get cancer. Whereas these guys were still healthy enough to live and actually not even get cancer. So Campbell's research and this idea that animal protein itself is some kind of switch for turning on and off cancer growth, it's a complete misrepresentation of what the actual research is. And unfortunately, it's that one, this one part of the book really has scared a lot of people away from eating animal products because it seems so convincing on the surface. So that's quite unfortunate. So bottom line, 
Uh, in Campbell's rat studies, the rats were exposed to massive levels of aflatoxin, which is the equivalent of eating at least 80,000 jars of aflatoxin com contaminated peanut butter in one sitting. I like, I mean, peanut butter tastes great, but how many people could eat, actually eat that much? I mean, it's okay, you can raise your hand, I won't judge. It's, I, thank you for your honesty back there, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you actually to Chris Masterjohn for this statistic too, because he wrote some great papers on this. And uh, the monkey study, on the other hand, was using lower aflatoxin dose that mimicked what would happen in real life. Uh, so you can kind of see that if we're going to look at any of these experiments and say, well, does this have any relevance to real life? It would be the monkey experiment, where the low protein monkeys were the ones dying. So there we go. The more realistic study actually showed the benefits of animal protein. Go figure. So uh, th I think this is just really important to remember if anyone out there ever gets uh, slammed over the head with a China study book and by a vegan who's trying to convince you that animal protein is causing cancer, just remember this research and remember that Campbell's research was not uh, something that can really have a direct application to real life because they just can't. <laughs> Sorry, I was... <laughs> So here's just a summary of everything we've talked about so far. Um, China study data. Animal foods were not directly associated with most diseases in the raw data. That just bottom line, that it just, it just wasn't there. And uh, even so, I think in the China study book, there was a problem of mistaking correlation with causation. Just because there's an association in observational data, it doesn't mean that one thing is causing another. We can never tell that unless we actually take an experiment into a controlled setting and manipulate variables and... Uh, <laughs> and yeah, manipulate variables and uh, see what exactly is causing what, how it's all linked together. And uh, the peer-reviewed research does not support the claims in the China study book. Even if you don't want to listen to me because I'm an English major and I spelled right W-R-I-T-E when I meant R-I-G-H-T, uh, I, I know that just totally ruined my credibility. I'm so sorry. Uh, don't, you don't have to listen to me. You can actually look up the original papers that were based on the China study data and it says the same thing. Ch Campbell was not correctly... I guess expressing the research of the giant study. And um, same goes for his rat research. It, it was a distortion of reality in many ways. And uh, lastly, the extrapolation of the effects of casein to all animal protein. I didn't mention this too much, but we have examples of, uh, say, whey protein. How many people have heard about the anti-cancer properties of whey protein? It's in very, like, just a huge number of studies have shown that whey protein actually has great uh, immunological properties, and it really uh, is health-boosting. And there's absolutely no evidence that that kind of protein contributes to cancer. So why are we assuming that casein is a good representation of every single kind of animal protein in existence? That just doesn't make sense. So I do want to say just a couple nice things about the China study because I don't like this to be all mean because I'm kind of a nice person sometimes. So, <laughs> so the good is that the China study argues that most modern diseases are influenced by diet. And I think that this is something that probably most people in here can agree with because I'm sure many of you have started out with some kind of chronic condition that you've seen improve with diet. And for people to kind of make the connection that what you eat really, really does influence your life, it influences how well you can live it, it influences how well you just feel every day, um, I think that a lot of people don't realize how strong that connection is. And so just the fact that this book kind of gets that idea out there, maybe that's a good thing, you know, even if the rest of it's not so good. And uh, it promotes a whole foods diet free from refined sugar, refined grains, and industrial oils, which I think probably most people in this audience uh, avoid most of those things anyway. So that's actually one commonality that Campbell has with low-carb diets and paleo diets is uh, the elimination of a lot of these refined carbohydrates. So my hypothesis is that that probably has something to do with the benefits that a lot of people see when they first switch to plant-based whole foods diets. Is that they're, it's not because they're ditching the meat, it's because they're ditching all these other foods. Um, and it also highlights the role of food industries and big pharma in dictating our health and guidelines, which is of special interest to me because I'm actually writing a book right now called Death by Food Pyramid. And it's going over. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm excited about it. There's some cool stuff that I'm going to put in it. And I think it's, it's something that not everyone realizes when you look at the ADA or the American, uh, even the American Heart Association. So much of what they write and the, what they publish is actually sponsored by food industries, and it's disgusting. You'll read a, like a handout sheet about 
the benefit or like the pros and cons of soda and it'll be sponsored by Pepsi. And I, most people don't even realize this and they don't realize that the what we conceive of as conventional wisdom is based so much on profit, it's based on keeping our economy afloat by promoting these really unhealthy but highly profitable foods. And uh, I just think it's nice that this book at least addresses that and kind of brings it to the surface, the fact that so much of our what we think we know about health is actually funded by something. So even if there's nothing else too fantastic in the book, maybe we can just agree on these points. <laughs> so, um, and that's it. And I wanted to leave a few minutes if we have some, if anyone has any questions, because uh, I, I thought maybe a couple of people might. I already saw some hands up. So um, thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something from this. <laughs> do I have to leave? Do I have to leave, or do we have time no, for questions? Yeah, you have Okay, anyone have any questions? Three, three, mi three minutes. Okay, three minutes for questions. Anybody have a question? Oh, in the orange, yeah. Denise, did I read somewhere when you said online that when you changed your diet, the color of your eyes changed? Yeah, actually. Can you repeat the question for Oh, yeah. She asked, um, when I made a dietary change, I saw the color of my eyes change. And yes, this actually happened when I became a raw foodist. And... I think it has something to do with glutathione because it has something to do with, I forget the exact way this works, but uh, if you're eating, if you have a very high glutathione level or something, it uh, interferes with melanin production, I think. Does anyone know anything about this actually? Because it's not something I've researched too much because um, I haven't actually been that interested in the explanation. But when I did switch to a raw food diet, uh, my eyes went from kind of a darker brown to greenish hazel. And it's actually something that a lot of raw foodists report. And um, I'm not sure that anyone really understands why that happens, but it is kind of interesting. So I don't know if that answers your question at all. Sorry. Yeah. What would you say to veg uh, vegetarians who say that um, their diet is more sustainable for the planet rather than pasturing cows? Um, I would say, actually, I would point them to a book called Meat, a Benign Extravagance by Simon Fairley. And I recommend this book to everyone because it is so, so, so well researched. And it blows that idea apart. It really, it shows that most of the, the data that those kinds of uh, arguments come from, it's really warped or it's miscalculated. And if you actually look at the reality of our food systems, uh, probably the most sustainable one is decentralized agriculture where we do have um, animals you know, eating on land that's unsuitable for planting crops and such forth. So uh, again, it's the book called uh, Meat a Benign Extravagance by Simon Fairley. And I would just say, read that book and then you don't have to argue with them anymore. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't Campbell using oxidized casein first? Um, I'm I'm not sure what kind of casein he was using, but it was highly refined, and there is some evidence that isolated casein itself may be more problematic. Uh, again, just in the isolated sense, than other forms of protein. So that's another problem with extrapolating it to all forms of animal protein. But it's one of those things where, when it's working in synergy with the actual whole food component in milk, the effects are completely different. So it's, you really can't say anything based on these refined studies, the refined diets. So, yeah. OK, thank you so much. Hope you enjoyed that takedown of tea. Colin Campbell's shenanigans um, in relation to the China study. A lot of I know a lot of a lot of us have basically had vagoons, basically just uh, you know pushing this in our face and trying to make uh, the arguments that uh, you know this is exactly what the actual data was actually saying. No, it wasn't. It's fabrications and shenanigans from the vagoonerized community. That's all it is. And I think that, um, uh, Denise's sort of, uh, you know, takedown was perfect. Um, so I, it saved me and many others having to go back and do months and months of research to basically find, to drill through this data. The, you know, so I will have to say thank you, Denise. Um, well done in your takedown. Now, there's a couple of points that I did want to cover, um, and I'll just have to, sh uh, let me share my screen. Okay. So, in terms of the glutathione, glutathione thing, um, there is a bit of truth in that. 
there's also some risks and I'll cover them shortly. Inhibition of pyrosinase, it's a key enzyme in melanogenesis. You see it in the vagoons that are basically do this fasting mimicking diets, which is basically what a fruitarian diet is, like Freely does and people like that. What it is, is basically, that's why she can't get a tan. She's in the tropics, because what happens is when you do these fasting mimicking sort of diets, you're not engaging the Randall cycle. You're, you're basically in a, in a sort of uh, this catabolic state. And as a consequence, you, do, you don't have protein substrates coming in. You're still generating some internal glutathione. Um, everybody does. Um, different, obviously, on a low-carbohydrate ketogenic type or um, carnivore diet, you'll generate more because of the insulin to glucagon ratio, but I'm not going to go into that at the moment, just covering that when you're in a fasted state, whether you're in a fasted mimicking state, you will generate more glutathione. So what happens is these people generate more, but they don't have the protein precursors that support melanogenesis. So they're not taking those in because they're in animal foods. So they're not actually taking in those. And then you've got slightly more um, glutathione, which has this inhibitory effect. Um, but that's endogenously. You don't want to be basically supplementing. That can be very dangerous. And basically this sort of, sort of called magic skin whitening. This is research out of the Republic of uh, the Philippines. And there are a lot of people that are basically getting a lot of health issues in regards to this. So we're talking about thyroid dysfunction, kidney dysfunction with potential development of renal failure, um, you know, liver dysfunction. So these people are doing intravenous glutathione and other things and, and, and in their skin and all sorts of other things, other compounds, which are pyrosinase inhibitors and actually causing themselves all types of health problems. So please don't do that. But this is what, what she described when she was doing a fruitarian diet um, that she was, her, her eye, um, the pigmentation in her eyes changed. And that's the reason why, um, pretty much. Now, the second part uh, that she actually, um, somebody mentioned about the ecological stuff and all that, that's the, um, the book, Meat and a Benign Extravagance. And that's very important that we understand this sort of stuff about how in the past, we had crop rotations before the so-called green revolution and the petrochemical inputs that caused all sorts of manner of issues um, to our environment. They've at our waterways, they polluted them heavily. You know, they've done far more damage to provide people um, sad dieters and um, vagoonerized kibble eaters, uh, their junk, cheap junk food which is basically what it is. At least this book does cover some of the um, issues about when it comes to animal husbandry, um, crop rotations and how to build soils, which is really important. Information which we'll need in the future. If we look at basically global um, availability of sort of petrochemicals and fertilizers and stuff like that, there are estimates that by the, the middle of the, the century, maybe towards the end of the century, we will be at peak, which means after that we'll be declining. So for long-term human um, food security, we need animals. We need animals to build soils and we need animals in agriculture. Remember, if you take a look at even people who are in the horticultural industry, what do they use to build their soils? Blood and bone comes from animal carcasses, you know? <laughs> from the slaughter industry. That is a reality. A lot of these people who have vagoonerized use these products because that's the only way they can build soils for their little gardens, but they ignore the sources of those nutrients where they're coming from. Plants in nature, it's animals that die around trees and around things that actually provide the nutrients. It's the way nature has worked, you know? Basically, everything has to die and be recycled by the great recyclers, which, you know, are the fungi of this planet. You know, it's a perfect system of, of a cycle of life and death. 
It's the problem is we've got modern humans that are living in cities that are so disconnected from this reality that have got a, a problem with death. That's really where, where it comes um, from. And, uh, you know, then they end up into misanthropy when it comes to their thinking. But this is a really good book that covers some of that sort of stuff. Now, the last point that was on casein, I've actually done a video which is called Does a High Protein Diet Cause Kidney Damage? Obviously not. And these rats were basically put on a casein of 74%. Okay, that's a complete protein source because you need a complete protein. But just because cancer cells that have been, that have been produced with massive levels of aflatoxin that you couldn't even consume in nature. That's why usually liver cancer takes decades and decades to happen by people being exposed to aflatoxin in the environment. It has nothing to do with the food source. If you provide complete protein from any source, you will get the same result. At the end of the day, you, you know, your body, it's the aflatoxin you need to avoid not the protein, because if you avoid the protein, you will basically be so malnourished, your body will break down. Without the essential amino acids, your body will not be able to function, create enzymes and all the other protein structures in your body, and you will break down and die a gruesome death. So whether you die a gruesome death one way, that way, or die a gruesome death over a long period of time from aflatoxin, you know, but aflatoxin, what are the two sources that are highest in aflatoxin in our diet? Nuts and legumes, especially peanuts. So, you know, I think people need to just get rid of those foods out of their diet. And if there are waterways that tend to have greater aflatoxin, like in certain parts of the tropics, that's where governments need to monitor that, that environment and actually limit the, the you know, fishing in that, those areas. You know, ban it, put signs up. In that regard, it's not the fish. It's not. Um, it's not. Um, you know that are causing the problem. It's basically the aflatoxin in the environment. And even then, because it's very small amounts, it takes a very long period of time before some people become susceptible due to much poorer detox cap capacities. Not everybody's got the same genetics. Some people have genetics where they're very good detoxifiers. Others have much poorer detoxification capabilities. So those people they're going to be the ones that are prone to this problem. So then that also is a minority of people that have got, tend to have this problem. So let's just put it into perspective. It's a non-issue. It's aflatoxin related. You eliminate the aflatoxin casein, you can have it up to 74% in any mammal. It's not gonna be a problem. You know, it's nonsense. Let's get over it. And let's stop the vagunarized out there and reductionist science, well, pseudoscience, basically muddly, muddying the waters. And uh, we need to basically push back against these shenanigans, especially the ones coming from people like T. Um, T um, Colin Campbell um, and uh, many of his supporters in the Vagunarized community. Hope you enjoyed um, Denise's takedown. She did a really good job. Um, and spent months and months doing the research of the and drilling through all that um, those data points, something that non, not the rest of us would have had the patience of doing. So she did a great service to the low carb community in general and to the and humanity in general because she basically showed, provided information to demonstrate that T. Colin Campbell is basically up to shenanigans and isn't, and his so-called the China study book was basically just a, a propaganda piece from the Vagunarized community and nothing else. Anyway, hope you enjoyed it. See yous.